this worship team. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. You all may be seated in Jesus' name. I want to publicly thank Brother Demetrius Amos. Hasn't he been doing a great job helping me? You know, it, it takes a lot to um, do what we do in ministry. There's a lot of components and parts to it. And so um, we greatly appreciate all the help and the assistance um, that we get. Amen. Amen. If you hear your name, I want you to please stand and remain standing. Christy Winters, Charles and Tina Adams, Maple Morgan, Gabriel Morgan, Brittany Nelson, D. Townsley, Crystal Prophet, Emma Lowe, Rodney Boone, Cassandra Israel, Jacqueline Tucker, Kevin Null, Lakeisha Null. All right, put your hands together for this great group of people. Amen. Amen. Come on, bless them real good. These are the newest members of Faith Family Church. Amen. Amen. So, so please remain standing. Please remain standing just for a moment. I want to make a commitment before God and to you. Um, we're growing. Amen. And um, this is probably one of the biggest membership classes that we've had uh, in this season. And I always do this, and I've always done this. Um, I thank God for calling me to be a pastor. And it's truly my honor to serve in that capacity. And there's certain commitments that I've made before God, and I want to make these same commitments to you. Number one, concerning the preaching and teaching of the word of God. To preach the word and to not preach false doctrine. Um, you know, given a microphone, you can stand in a position and pretty much say whatever you want to say in the freedom of speech. But Paul wrote Timothy and he said, preach the word. And so even though I may not be the most, uh, uh, the greatest preacher that you've ever heard, one of the things that I purpose to give you is the word of God. Amen. Not that I know 100% of everything that's in the word of God, but my commitment is to preach with all sincerity and compassion, that which we see and that which we know. Amen. Secondly, is to keep myself sexually pure. Uh, there have been times in the body of Christ where we've seen pastors or leaders, ministers that fall into some kind of sexual impropriety. And I've made a, a commitment before God, you know, even when I was an unmarried man and, and now that I'm a married man, um, so that you don't hear in the news that you're pastor and run off with the church secretary. Amen. So we don't even have a church secretary for that reason. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, um, but that's a, that's a commitment that I make before God, and, I, and I'll make that commitment because you're bringing your families. You should be able to trust in that respect. Then also, um, to, I make the commitment where finances are concerned. I'm the fiduciary in responsibility here at uh, Faith Family Church, Houston Faith Family Church Incorporated. And uh, we do have a board of directors that oversees particularly the finances of the ministry. And uh, again, in terms of what the scripture says is that I as a, as a minister should not be greedy for filthy lucre. Amen. And so it's not just what I say, um, but there's an accountability co that comes into play. So I make that commitment uh, financially. And then last but not least, the, the most important one for me is that I keep myself free from the sin of pride. Being in a position of authority as a leader, it's so easy to get the big head and to think that everybody's running around attending to you. Then, you know, you're the big I and they're the little you. Jesus said, the one that is the leader, let him be the servant. Amen. And so I serve you and your families and I'm honored to be your pastor. Once again, welcome to the faith family. We're so glad that you're here. Amen. You may be seated. A couple things before I get into the Word of God. How many of y'all excited about God's Word coming today? Amen. All right. Um, coming up this Friday, Brother Paul Sheffield is going to be a part of a, um, a program that's being put on 
by the Fellowship of Love Church in Richmond. Uh, Paul Sheffield is a member of Faith Family, but he's also a business owner. He's an entrepreneur, and he has an entrepreneurial spirit. So if you own a business, then um, I want to encourage you to come on out. Uh, it's, uh, you, you'll have to text me to get the exact information. I know you can't see it from there. Um, but of course, I want you to know that my calling is to help you fulfill your calling, whatever that is. And uh, I'm just showing you that we're standing with him in support of that in Jesus' name. Also, Sister Linda um, sent in a text to say that she's aware of some jobs that have been posted and available through Reliant. And so um, if you are interested in working uh, or looking for a job, then text us, send us an email, and uh, we'll be able to give you direction in that respect in the name of Jesus. All right. Put your hands together for our teenagers. They're about to be dismissed to go with Pastor Carol to our youth church. We love you guys. Sixth to 12th grade, my goodness, it's a bunch of blessed children. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you all ready to get into the Word of God? Okay, so hold up your Bible or whatever you're going to use for your Bible, and let's make this confession. Say this out loud. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible. So I make this as a confession. That I will meditate therein. Both day and night. On a chapter in the morning. And a chapter in the evening. And because I do. My life is blessed. It's no more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch, now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this, another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us to see it. Help us to get it. Your word for us. In the name of Jesus, we covenant to give you and you only all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen. Amen. Open with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Luke chapter 11. We're going to start a brand new series today that's called Ask, go back, Receive and speak. This is a series that's based on Luke chapter 11 all the way from verse 5 through 13. So we're going to take a moment um, to read that. All right. So Luke chapter 11 and verse 5 says this. Verse 5 says, and he said, um, just turn it so that it points on me. See, when you're this dark skin, you need a lot of lights. <laughs> All right, right there. Okay, there we go. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Y'all ready for the word of God today? All right. He said to them, this is Jesus talking. He says, which of you shall have a friend? I want you to imagine that you have a friend. And they come to you at midnight and they say, friend, lend me three loaves. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut. My children are in bed with me. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though, he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread for any father among you, will he give him a stone? I have a son. I wouldn't do that. And if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? He says, if he asks for an egg, will he for an egg offer him a scorpion? The answer to all those questions is no. 
So he says, if you then, being evil, natural, human, or carnal, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So we're starting another series today that's called Ask, Receive, Speak. And the challenge in this series is to show you or to teach you from the word of God, actually, how to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I'm under an assignment from the Lord to take the time and to make this abundantly plain so that if you're here and you're not yet baptized with the Holy Spirit, or if you are here and you are baptized, all of us together will completely understand how to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, so my assignment is to teach you that from the word about the baptism. We're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be talking about speaking in tongues. Notice that I separated it by the word and. This is not a series just about speaking with tongues. And if you make it the emphasis, you might miss the message. I'll say that again. This is not just a series about speaking in other tongues. And if you make that the issue, if you make that what I'm teaching, then you'll really miss the message. Because the message is to help you understand about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And it's also to teach you what the Word says about speaking in tongues. Amen? Now, the reason why I say that is because of what the Word of God says about Jesus. Jesus is the one who baptizes people with the Holy Ghost. I didn't make up this concept, so don't be mad at me. Come on, somebody. Your Bible actually talks about that Jesus was sent to the earth by God to actually baptize people with the Holy Spirit. The other week I asked, how many of you have been baptized with water? Almost 95% of people raised their hand. Amen. We know we're not confused about it. It's not that we're, we're, I'm not sure if I was baptized in water. I mean, you know that you know when you've been baptized with water. And in the same way John was sent to baptize people with water, Jesus was sent by God to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. So we're going to talk about that experience through the word of God, I've asked the Holy Spirit to help me articulate. I've asked God to help me by the Holy Spirit articulate this message to put it in a form that you can absolutely receive. In John chapter 1, where do you get this information from, Pastor Stan? I'm glad you asked. In John chapter 1 and verse 32, John bore witness. This is something that he actually experienced himself. He saw the Spirit of God descending from heaven like a dove. Notice he did not see a dove coming down from heaven. I know they put that in the, in, in the pictures in the back of the Bible. You know, this beautiful dove, you know, coming down and maybe sitting on Jesus' shoulder. No, that's not, what, that's not what happened the day that Jesus was baptized. Je, John, Jesus went to John to be baptized in water, just like we baptize people in water here. And so Jesus went down into the water, and when he came up out of the water, something supernatural happened. The Bible says that the heavens were open. God spoke and said, this is my beloved son. The father spoke, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. At the same time, they saw, John saw the Holy Spirit descend from heaven and came down like a dove, and he remained upon him. Emphasis on the word upon. Notice he didn't go in him, but he rested upon him. Amen. Now, how many of y'all know there's a difference with something being in you and something being on you? And when you talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about the Holy Spirit being in you. When you are born again, when you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, Jesus said the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. 
But then he instructed his disciples to wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So that means the Bible teaches that there are two experiences, two different distinct experiences of the Holy Spirit. One is the Holy Spirit in you, and the other one is the Holy Spirit upon you. Amen. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is actually talking about him being on you. Well, John said, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So that's where I got this from. John was sent by God. You know, I don't know where he was, but at some point God visited John, maybe by an angel, maybe he heard a voice, and God instructed him, I want you to go preach to the people, and I want you to baptize them in water. He, he preached repentance. So he would go into the wilderness, and he would talk about you need to repent from your sins. And sure enough, the people went out into the wilderness to hear John preach. And if they believed him, then they were baptized with the baptism of repentance because that's what he was sent to do. Notice that John was sent to baptize with water, but Jesus was sent to baptize with the Holy Spirit. So that leaves the question to ask, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Unquestionably, your Jesus, my Jesus, baptizes people with the Holy Spirit. My question to you today is, have you had that experience? Now, of course, that answer could come in three forms. It could be yes, it could be no, it could be I'm not sure. Any answer is okay, but it's what God brought you here today to consider. Have you been baptized? The Jesus that you love, the one that you serve, he baptizes people with the Holy Spirit. Um, now, there's a note that I don't want to miss. So remember this. You are not forced to get this. If you do not want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and if you do not want to speak with tongues, you do not have to. You know, the Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whosoever speaks with tongues shall go to heaven. This is something that you have to want. He's not going to force it on you. He wants it for you, but he's not going to make you do this. So I don't want you to feel pressure. At least give it, um, you owe it to yourself because speaking in tongues is in your Bible. This will help you understand and be able to communicate with people, those that do and those that don't, so you're not misunderstood. So thank God we have teachers from the Word of God, like myself, that can lay it out and look at the Scriptures in context. Amen? So don't resist it because, again, this is something that the Jesus that you love, if you love him, then you should follow, at least follow the leading of his teaching. Amen? So <clears throat> now I'm simply establishing in this first point that Jesus is the one who baptizes believers with the Holy Spirit. A unbeliever cannot be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But if a believer wants to be, he will baptize them, but I can't. So I want you to understand, um, I've not been sent to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. So when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want you to understand, I can't baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus' job. Paul had this revelation when he was ministering to the church at Corinth because they had gotten into factions. They were excited about, you know, being of Peter or being of Paul and some were of Jesus. And he said, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. He's talking about baptizing them in water um, because they were, you know, taking favorites. And then he said, well, I baptize a few of you. But in the book of 1 Corinthians 1 and 17, I want, you to, I want you to see this. Verse 17 says, for Christ did not send me to baptize. He's talking about baptize people with water. But to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, let, uh, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Notice he recognized that wasn't his assignment. I was sent from Detroit to Houston to be your pastor. That's my assignment. But my assignment is not to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's Jesus' job. 
So again, the reason why I point that out is because if you haven't had this experience, he wants it for you. It's a part of what God sent him into your life to do. He wants to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, but it's up to you. Amen. Now, in the same way, I also want you to understand that I cannot, just like I can't baptize you with the Holy Spirit, I cannot teach you how to speak in tongues. Now, I know there have been some churches that, you know, you come up here to the altar and they get you and they rub you in the back and, and tell you to let go and they push you in the front and tell you to hold on. <laughs> I was a child crawling up under the pews in my father's Baptist church on Iroquois Street in Detroit uh, at a prayer service. Now, now uh, he was in the Baptist church from, uh, for, for three years. And one of the reasons he got kicked out of the Baptist churches for what I'm about to tell you. I remember it was fun to crawl. We would be in the back and we would crawl up under the pews, you know, from row to row, you know, just kind of crawling through. And I remember he, you know, he come, he sit me up one day and told me, don't do that. And, and uh, he said, no, just say thank you, Jesus, over and over again, because we were in prayer service. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And that's how people are supposed to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. They're supposed to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And like a tongue twisting. All of a sudden, they don't know what they're saying. Come on. Y'all got to help. I'm not talking. I cannot teach you how to speak. I don't want you to misconstrue this. I can't, I can't give you the tongues to speak, but I can teach you about speaking in tongues from the scripture. So I don't want you to misunderstand where we're going. Amen. All right. Now, have you ever heard the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink? You know, I'm feeling this today. Now, I'm not calling you a horse, but please don't make this hard for me today. Right? And so I am going to lead you through the teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I can't make you get baptized. I'm going to lead you into a teaching about speaking in tongues, but I can't teach you how to speak in tongues. Amen? So in that way, I can teach you about it, but I can't do it for you. I can teach you about speaking in tongues, but I can't give you the tongues to speak. You know, one of the things that um, I appreciate about the way God ministers to me and how I've been developed in ministry is that through the years, he's made things extremely plain to me. And then I've noticed as a pastor, when I feed the flock of God, that things come out extremely simple. I remember when Sister Jenny, wave your hand, when Sister Jenny first came to Faith Family, she was just like in awe, like, oh my gosh, I'm hearing things in, from the word that I've never seen, and I'm understanding better than I ever have. She came as a first time visit, and she just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. Amen. The Bible talks about, the reason why I point that out is because the Bible talks about that there is a simplicity in Christ. In other words, the things of Christ shouldn't be complicated, shouldn't be hard to understand. In other words, it shouldn't be calculus. It should be more like arithmetic. Notice the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, but I fear Paul was writing to the church and he says, I'm concerned about you guys. Why? Lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Notice, it should be simple, but yet it's confusing. And the reason why this is one of the most confused subjects in the body of Christ is because, not because of God, not because of co the complexity of it, but because the enemy's deception. Now, what is deception? Deception is when you make somebody think something is true that is not. And so the enemy has propagated lies throughout the body of Christ to confuse us because he doesn't want us walking in measures of power and authority over his life. And so he'll bring about deception and make you think things. I remember the first time I used to hear it was that speaking in tongues was of the devil. And then, of course, full gospel churches got a hold of the fact that it is in the Bible and it's undeniable. Now the propagation of the lie is that it's for some, but it's not for all. That it's the gift of tongues. And I'm okay with you talking about tongues because some get it and others don't. 
But the reality of it is the Holy Spirit is for everybody that believes. And so would be the baptism. Now, so the enemy was able to deceive Eve from one of the most simple instructions that God had ever given. He said, of all the trees of the garden you can eat, but of this tree you are not allowed to eat. How can you confuse that only by deception? And notice that he says, I'm concerned lest your minds, that's your intellect, that's your understanding, may be corrupted from the simplicity. If there's any confusion, it would be in the mind and not in the heart. Ooh, I'm preaching better than I did at 830. Come on. And so watch trying to understand what I minister in this message. Watch trying to understand it with the mind. Because in other words, your mind can cause the simplicity of it to be complicated. Listen, God is not the author of confusion. Y'all know that's a verse in the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as it is in all of the churches. If you come to church and leave confused, something went wrong. Man, I'm preaching good. Come on now, think about that. If you come to church and you leave confused, then something went wrong. Why? Because church should be simple. I should be able to understand it, get it, and apply it in my life and experience victory after victory as a result. The only one who wants you to be confused about the subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and of speaking in of tongues is the devil. Don't allow him to, to cloud your mind. Now, what's so unique is especially people who have gone beyond the norm and actually read their Bible. 1 Corinthians 14 is probably one of the most misunderstood chapters in the Bible. How do you say that? This is the chapter that talks most about speaking with tongues in the church and in your private life. And if you don't have a good understanding, you almost could leave it confused. But thank God he gives you pastors according to his own heart who will feed you with knowledge and information. Thank God for a good pastor. Amen? Amen. So let me ask, this is the question for the day. Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Now, if you have your notes, I want you to write your answer down, or if you just want to answer it in your heart. There's only three ways you can answer this question. Yes, no, or I'm not sure. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but in your heart, because Jesus is the one who does this. Have you had this experience with God that's called the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Now, if the answer is yes, my question to you is how do you know? Because you might be here and you might say yes because you know you have the Holy Spirit in you, but you don't speak with thought. So in your, as far as your, in your mind and the way you believe and how you've seen scriptures in the Bible, you believe that you're baptized with. So my question to you is how do you know? What scriptures do you base your believing on? I can believe that I'm a car just because I park in the garage. <laughs> Come on, how many of y'all know that just because you park in the car, if you park in the garage doesn't make you a car? But you can believe what you want, Right. So my question is, how do you know that you've been baptized? What, what are you basing that on? What scriptures promise you what you believe? Amen. And if you don't have scriptures, then make sure as we go through this that you align yourself and be able to answer emphatically, yes, because of what it says in this chapter. And in this, and Jesus said in the mouth of two, matter of fact, he was quoting the Old Testament, the prophet Moses said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Because it may be that there's an experience that awaits you, that you with God that you haven't received yet. So the question is, according to the scripture, have you been baptized? If your answer is no, that's okay. You're not forced to get this, but follow the leading of Jesus' teaching. My question to you then, if the answer is just straight up no, my question is, do you want to be? That's so important as you're about to see. And another way to ask that is, what's stopping you? 
because there may be something that's stopping you. It may be what you've heard about it and that you're not comfortable with it or you've been confused. With. There could be a number of You could think that because of the sins in your life, because of how you're living, because of addictions or because of things that you have done in your path, you could feel like you're not worthy for the Holy Spirit baptism. What's stopping you? What's most interesting about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as we see it in Scripture, it commonly first happens with those that are newly saved. And when you're newly saved, you still got stuff that you are still, come on, learning to get the victory over. Amen. What's stopping you from receiving this experience from God if, you, if your answer is no? And then you might be here and you might say, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm baptized. I'm Kind of hearing you. I think I heard. I think I am, but maybe I'm not. You talking about tongues? And I'm like, I don't know about that. I remember one time I was in a moment, and I, I, just, I don't know if it was tongues, but I was just. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, right? The Bible says these things are written so that you may know. You ought to be able to have confidence. So, um, we're going to take you through this today. Is this all right? Amen. So the first step to being baptized with the Holy Spirit is simply to ask. If you want to be, you have to ask. That means it's not up to God, it's up to you. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And in answer to the question, have you been baptized? If you have not, I can tell you from the scripture, it's because you haven't asked. A lot of times people are waiting, you know, I believe it. I believe it is in the Bible. And if it, you know, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. You know, God is sovereign. Well, no, yeah, God has sovereign power and control in, in, a, in a universal sense. But he didn't tell you what to wear this morning unless you asked him. In other words, it's up to you. you John Wesley said it this way, and this is a better way to say it. It seems as though God is limited. He's the founder of the Methodist Church. It seems as though God is limited by our prayer life. It's as though he can do nothing in the earth unless somebody asks him. God doesn't just move based on need. If God moved based on the needs in your life, then all you would have to do is come up with a need and he'd move and make, make that need met. I could tell you, for example, there are children that are starving all over the planet today. They need food. You would think that in this sovereignty, if God was moved by needs, that he would feed them this morning. They wouldn't go to sleep tonight without something to eat because God wants the little children to be taken care of. But God's not moved by need. Seems as though God is limited by our prayer life, and you can't limit God. In Psalm 70, they limited the Holy One of Israel because of their unbelief. You can limit God's move in your life by simply not asking him. He is absolutely the example of gentlemen. He's not going to force you to do anything. You've got to ask. What do you mean? Let me give you another scripture. Another way to say it, it's not up to God for you to be baptized. It's up to you to be baptized. You actually have to want to be. You have to ask. Here's another scripture that, that confirms that. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, Jesus said, don't, don't be like the heathen. For your father knows the things you have need of, but it's before you ask him. This is, again, proof that you have to ask. He knows what you need in your life, but he's not just going to move based on need. You got to ask him. Come on, somebody. Amen. And so in order for you to receive the baptism, you have to. And listen, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, you may not think you need to be, but you need to be. If you're married, listen, let me tell you, you need the Holy Spirit. Because the whole definition of romance is doing something for somebody and they don't have to ask you. 
And so, I mean, if if you're raising children, you need the help of the Holy Spirit. If you're if you're working on a job, if you need a job, you need to be baptized with the. There's extreme benefits that come. You receive power after that. The Holy Spirit has come upon you. Amen. But if you don't believe you need to be, you won't ask. Is that right? If you don't believe you need this, you won't want this. Don't stop short. And if you believe that you are and you're actually not, then of course you won't ask. But the first step to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to what? Come on, help me, class. Is to ask. Look at John chapter 7. Now, this is so cool. I'm actually going to look at John 7, 37 through 39, and I'm going to go jump back to verse 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood. Maybe he was sitting down laying down, kneeling, something. He stood and he cried out. The King James actually said he stood and he cried. He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly or his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, I like to read with comprehension, right? So anytime you, you, you're reading the scripture, make sure you read it to the point where you understand it. And another way I encourage you is actually imagine yourself at this moment. So will you all do this with me? So let's go there. The Bible says on the last day, that means this has been going on for several days. Matter of fact, this is the great day. This is the big day of the feast. Now, a feast is actually a festival. Now, it's a Jewish feast. And so they were scheduled at certain times throughout the year to, to celebrate certain things. And, and they weren't having preaching services. They weren't, you know, healing the sick and casting out devil. They weren't doing miracles among Jesus is simply at a party. Party! Woo! I said that to wake him up right now. He's kind of, amen. So I want you to imagine being at a party. What do you have at a party? You've got a food table. You've got a drink table. You've got entertainment. People are fellowshipping and gathering together. They're just hanging out. All of a sudden, Jesus stands up. That brings attention. If everybody's sitting at the tables, if everybody's just doing this, he, he stands up, which brings attention to himself. He lifts his voice. I don't know if he had tears coming down his eyes. And he says, if anybody is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now, that's actually okay at a party if you're standing by the drink table come on y'all help me now if you if you're the person responsible to help people and you serve and hey if you all need something you know jesus did turn wine to water into wine at a festival come on somebody so maybe they had some wine at this festival now i want you to imagine now if it was like anything like a family reunion from the folks where i come from and you got somebody standing up talking about if you're thirsty then come unto me and drink. The drink table is over there, Jesus. You, you have one of them uncles and had one too many. They're out there. Oh, everybody, everybody. And so I want you to imagine, how many of y'all know that's going to bring attention? It's like, okay, he's not standing by the drink table. You're, you're listening and you know this is Jesus. He's got a reputation. He's a minister. What is he talking? How many of y'all want to know what is he talking about? What is he talking about? If you're thirsty, are you talking about, are you talking about physical water? Or what are you talking about, right? If you're thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And the next thing he says, and if you believe in me, then like the scripture says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water so he's talking about if you're thirsty and if you believe in who i am and what i've been sent to do john told them what he was sent to do he said if you believe in me and what i've been sent to do then you're gonna have an experience there's something going to come up out of your heart and it's gonna flow like a river so let me ask you, in your experience in answering this question, have I been baptized with the Holy Ghost? Have you been in that place where something has come up out of your heart that flowed 
And if you can check the box, yes, then all right, we're moving right along. We're getting close because, again, it's out, it's out in the mouth for two or three witnesses. So then he goes on. He says, but this he spoke concerning the spirit. So he's not talking about, you know, if you want something to drink naturally. He's not talking about water coming up out of your belly naturally. Somebody say yuck. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he's particularly talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You say, how do you say that? He says the baptism, the reason I can say it's the baptism, because those believing on him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Anytime you have that phrase referring to when the Holy Spirit was given, it was on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given. He was poured out from heaven by God into the earth in a way like never before. So he's referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now let's put all the pieces back together. If any man is thirsty, you've got to want this. You've got to come to me. That means you've got to ask. I'm not going to force this. I'm not going to do it randomly. I'm not just going to pick some people that have lived such a good life. I'm not going to pick others. I'm not going to leave these out. Everyone who wants this can receive this. Now, we said you can't lead a horse to water. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Mario Cortez says a good teacher will lead the horse to water, but an excellent teacher will make the horse thirsty first. <laughs> I am hoping that through this series, I can make you thirsty. Because if you don't get thirsty for this, then you won't go to him and ask him for this. Is this fair? So if you're not thirsty, you won't go to him. So it's up to who? It's up to you. Let's go on. So Luke chapter 11 and verse number 13. Now, what's interesting about Luke chapter 11, we read from verse 5 all the way to verse 13. He's not just making profound statements. For example, everybody should brush their teeth before they leave the house. Well, I thought it was funny. Okay. <laughs> He's not just saying random stuff, in other words, that sounds profound. Ask and you shall receive. Well, duh. Seek and you shall find. Right? Ring the doorbell and somebody will come open it. He's not just randomly saying profound things that are disconnected from the point that he's trying to make. The point that this entire passage is trying to make is that if you ask the whole, if you ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, He will give it to you. Or He will give Him to you. He's not an it, He's a person. Amen? So let's walk back through it in our minds. He said, which of you having a friend coming to you and late at night and asking you for something, even though you wouldn't do it just because you asked him, but because you were persistent. Because he was persistent, you'll do it. What does that tell me about the Holy Spirit? In other words, well, I asked, well, I tried that and it didn't work. Come on. How bad do you want it? What is he teaching? He's teaching you how to receive the bad. You have to be persistent. They stayed in that upper room for day after day after, not knowing when it was going to happen. I mean, after the third day, they're waiting for this baptism with the Holy Spirit that he said that was going to happen not many days. Well, you know how it is. You know, you, you, you tell me, give me a couple of those, man. And if you grew up in Detroit, it's like, okay, one, two. Oh, man, come on, give me a few. All right, one, two, three. So notice that they're staying there, and he said, well, no, I mean, don't leave just yet, Brother, brother Paul, or, or, you know, Brother Peter. Don't leave yet, man. I mean, just hold on. He said, not many. So it's not just two. It's not just a few. And so for day after day after day, they stayed in that place, and it came to pass on the 10th day. In other words, they wanted it bad enough to however long it took. 
Come on, somebody. What else can we learn? Another thing we can learn in this passage of Luke is that if you ask, you will receive. It's not like, well, maybe, maybe I'll give it to you. Maybe I won't. If you live right, if you stop smoking, if you stop drinking, if you stop doing that, then I'll give you the Holy Spirit because you know you're not worthy. Come on, somebody. What did Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? Y'all going to help me to now. He said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall receive. Fine. Knock and it shall. Because everyone that asks is what? Receive. Everyone that seeks what? Fine. And everyone that knocks it what? Shall be open. It's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you want it, you can have it, but it's up to you. And then one last instruction on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, asking the Father to give you the Holy Spirit. He says, look, if any one of your children ask for something good, would you give them something bad? And if you got that much sense, how much more sense does your heavenly father? So you can rule out, well, you know, they say you got to watch speaking in tongues because you can end up speaking in the devil's tongue. <laughs> Y'all got to help me in the church. You must, you got to watch it. You can end up speaking in the devil's tongue. What? How, if you know how to give good He's not going to give you something bad. You're not going to end up opening up your heart and ending up in some worse kind of way. The entire passage is about asking so that you can receive. So the first step in the baptism is you've got to ask. Now, again, you don't have to ask, but if you want to be baptized, you don't have to be baptized, but if you want to be baptized, you have to ask. Amen. Now, I should be able to back that up through the scripture. In other words, if we see people in the Bible being baptized with the Holy Spirit, notice I'm not focusing on the tongues. If we just go through the Bible and look at people receiving the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit or being baptized with the Holy Spirit, it should then be some way or another connected to them asking for it. You know, it's not like you just walking down the street and randomly you start or you just random, you know, just it just happened. You didn't ask. No. What, was, what you'll see in the pattern of the scripture is that the people who were baptized, they were in prayer or somebody came and prayed for them. In other words, they wanted it and so they received it. It didn't just fall randomly on a bunch of people who weren't expecting it or wanting it. Is that fair? All right, so that'll make you at ease. You know, you'd be driving home and you don't want it and then all of a sudden something gonna take over. You know, you ain't gotta worry about that. <laughs> Because if you don't want it, you don't have it, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> so now here's the wonderful thing. In the book of Acts, which is most relevant to the church today, there are five occasions in Scripture where individuals or an individual received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke with tongues. We refer to the group in Acts chapter 1, the precedent setting a group. He told him in verse 4, he says, now, don't depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise which you've heard, for you shall be baptized not many days from now. And when you're baptized, you'll receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's 4, that's verse 5, and that's verse 8. In verse 14, notice where we find them. These all continued within, with one accord in what? prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of James, and with his brother. In all, there were 120 people that heard Jesus tell them about the baptism, and they all waited, and they weren't just waiting around, well, you know, anything, you, anything happened to you yet? They were waiting in what? prayer they would get up in the morning well let's let's just spend some time praying before God and notice I'm going to tell you how is it going to happen that the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs in your life it can be as a result of you just waking up on a Monday morning before you go to work before you send your children or your your husband or your wife out to work and you just take some time and you're just in prayer I wouldn't be surprised if you leave that moment with an experience that you'll never forget you've got to want it they were in prayer and supplication and sure enough in Acts chapter 2 they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance 
man, I can't wait till we get to next week. It just gets better and better. All right, so we'll leave that group alone. The next group we showed you was in the book of Acts chapter 8. This was when Philip went to Samaria and he's preaching and folks got saved. Jerusalem heard that folks got saved in Samaria and they were like, well, did they get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit? Did they get saved and baptized with the Holy Spirit? Why? Because both are important. No, he just baptized them in water. Well, what are we going to do? They need to be baptized in water and they need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. What are we going to do? All right, Peter and John, y'all go down there and minister to them. Peter and John come down and are ministering to them the bible says when they came down in verse 15 they what prayed for them that they might receive the holy spirit or be baptized with the holy spirit notice that the baptism of the holy spirit is linked to and again connected to prayer that's asking Notice in verse 17 also, he says, then they laid hands on them and they were baptized or received the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a little added. Uh, that's in a little in addition. So not only did they pray for them, they laid hands on them. They ministered to them personally and they were baptized as a result of that ministry. What's the next one? In Acts chapter uh, 19, we referred to, we looked at this one for weeks. Paul going to a certain place, he found out certain people were saved. He found out that they had been baptized under John's baptism. He talked to them about Jesus being sent to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. And when he, Paul, laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues. That just goes with it. And they prophesied. But what I want to emphasize is that he prayed for them, laid hands on them. They wanted it. They were okay with it. They were like, okay, tell us about it. We want this. He ministered to them. And as a result, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with other tongues. That's the third time. Let's look at the fourth time. If I could show you this again and again, it ought to set a pattern. So then when you go to answer the question, have you been baptized with water? I mean, if you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit and you say yes, and in what scriptures? Well, I, I remember this and I did this and it's the same thing that happened to people in scripture. Is that fair? All right. Well, let me give you another. How many of y'all remember the Apostle Paul? Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, Paul told the church, he said, I thank God that I speak with tongues. Matter of fact, I thank God I probably speak in tongues more than all of you put together. He did a whole lot of praying in tongues, and God was able to use him a lot. All right, I got that tongue then, and I don't, don't trip over the tongues in your shoes. They come with the shoes. So Paul, Paul used to persecute the church. He held the coats of people that murdered Christians. He was involved in arresting them and, and persecuting and beating them down and, and so forth. But one day he got saved. A light shone round about him. He fell to the ground. He heard Jesus from heaven saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. What are the pricks? He had been touching his heart and saying, you're going in the wrong way. Some of you are here today because you got the prick of the Holy Ghost. God ministering to your heart. You need this. There's another level for your life. And until you receive the fullness, you won't be able to experience the fullness. So he moves you to be here some of you don't even want to come like when you gonna be done you said a new series you tricked me you doing the same thing <laughs> so paul got saved but he couldn't see they led him and they took him to a certain city in between here and damascus and he was in the house and god told him i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some instructions in a few days and so he's waiting he didn't leave the house and say, you know what, forget this. Uh-uh, I'm going back to life. He was waiting. Matter of fact, he was waiting in prayer. You say, how do you know he was waiting in prayer? Because of Acts chapter 9 and verse 11. So the, the Lord said to him, arise, talking to Ananias, arise, go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. In a matter of a few verses, because you all wouldn't allow me two hours to preach this message, I just have to give you the highlights. Come on, somebody. What you're seeing is he was waiting in a place of prayer, and in just a few verses, being in a place of prayer, he's about to be baptized. 
baptized with the Holy Ghost. What does that prove? It proves that ask and you'll receive. Amen. The next verse in verse 17, Ananias went his way, entered into that house. He laid hands on him and said to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me. Why? So that you could re receive your sight. But what else? So that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you've ever wondered why God sent you to Faith Family Church, it was not just so you can have another good message that's kind of like what you have already heard, but he brought you here so he could take you to your next level. Come on, somebody. If all you have been is baptized in water, there's another experience in God that awaits you called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. He laid hands on him. Paul received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we know that he spoke with tongues. I'm going to close with the fifth time this happened. In the fifth time, it was in the passage of Scripture that Pastor Demetrius shared with us this morning. And this is supernatural. He didn't know what I was preaching. The only thing the church knew was that I'm going to start a new series. But Acts chapter 10 has been hot on my heart because I hadn't shared this one with you all. And it's about a man who was a man of prayer. He told us that this guy prayed continually and gave alms continually. Well, the Bible says in verse 2 that a devout man who was, he, uh, Cornelius was a devout man who feared God with all his house. He gave alms generously to the people and he prayed to God always. How many of y'all remember the story when Peter went up into the housetop and he fell into a trance and he saw this sheet come down from heaven and there were all kind of four-footed beasts and, and unclean animals and God said, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And it happened three times and he was thinking about it. This is that story. Listen, you can play something softer, I'm sorry. Um, this is that story. Cornelius loved God, but he wanted more of God. He prayed to God always, and there are some of you that are here because you love God. But notice God's heart. You need the baptism in order to get to your next level. What can I do for Cornelius? He's, he needs the help of the Holy Spirit. Ah, I can use Peter. Hmm, how can I do this? Cornelius is here and Peter is there. The Holy Spirit spoke. There's some men coming from Cornelius' house, Peter. I want you to go with them. How was he able to hear the Holy Spirit speak? Because he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Peter gets down and he goes and he's like, why do I need to go with them? He takes some other Jews with him. Cornelius had an experience. An angel appeared to him and said, send men to Peter and he's going to tell you what to do. So Cornelius called all of his household, called all of his relatives and called all of his close friends. Now think about it. Think about your household. Is everybody say, oh, okay, right. All right. Well, what about, maybe, and that's good, but what about all your relatives? How about this? How about your friends? So, you know, in this group that came to hear Peter, you had to be some folks in there that, that weren't saved yet, maybe newly saved. The Bible said that this whole group gathered together. And in Acts, Peter's teaching them. And while Peter was teaching them, the Holy Spirit fell upon all of those that heard the word. Well, how do you see the Holy Spirit fall on somebody? You can't see the Spirit, right? I'll show you. How did they know the Holy Spirit fell? Those of the circumcision who believed and were astonished, they were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles also. How do you know? Because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Okay, hold up, hold up. You're tripping me up with these tongues things. So go back, go back, go back. <laughs> Notice, Peter comes down to Cornelius' house. 
Come on, y'all, y'all get this so we can go home. Peter comes down to Cornelius' house and he starts preaching. And there's a group, maybe a group this size. They want to be there. They want more of God. He's like, you know, I just feel like there's more in our relationship with God. The Bible says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And so these people came to hear God. They want God in their lives. And and, and, and especially Cornelius is a man of prayer. He's asking God, what do I need to be a better man? What do I need to be a better wife? What do I need to be a better husband or a father? And he sends them exactly what they did. While Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit was poor. Well, how do you know? Well, the people that came with Peter were there at the beginning when the Holy Spirit was poured out the first time. He, they were there when they heard people speak with tongues. And so they were astonished. They were like, oh, man, look at this. Whoa. You know how, come on, y'all not astonished, right? Y'all not astonished. Now, man, whoa, man. They were like, did you see that? What were they astonished about? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentile. Man, that we are Jews. They are Gentiles. Can you believe that they received the same baptism that we, they're speaking in tongues? How did they know? Why were they astonished? Because they heard. They knew it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How? Because they heard them speak with tongues. Stand up on your feet. I'm done. This is powerful, y'all. I forgot to tell this testimony, <clears throat> so don't cut me off yet, guys. Miss Jenny, love you so much. Last week, over the past few weeks, <clears throat> I've been saying if you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, text the word spirit, and I'll minister to you personally. Well, man, she was at a women's event. She gave them a connect card and like, tell Pastor Stan to, talk, to call me. And then she texts spirit, and I guess I didn't get to her fast enough. She said, now you said, so we set up a time for last Sunday after service. We sat in the office. She asks, I, I shared the same scriptures that I shared with you. She received, and she spoke. Am I right about that? She spoke with tongues. Amen. I shared about Tony Burst. Uh, this is her nephew. This is Jacqueline. Her nephew reached out to me. I thought he was reaching out to me to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so, but he was just, you know, wanting to talk to his pastor. Amen. But when he got in the car, in the truck, I, I said, are you baptized with the Holy Spirit? And he was like, yeah. And I said, do you speak with tongues? He was like, oh, I, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I said, do you want to be? He said, well, yeah. I share with him the same scriptures that I'm sharing with you. He asked, he received, and he spoke with tongues. I'm telling you, it's one of the easiest things. You know, but what trips people up is they're, they're waiting for something. This series is going to help you out, okay? The first step is just to want it. Lastly, Michael White, who's been a part of the church for years, but more importantly, he got saved not too long after they've been married, and they've been married for like 25 years. He's been born again, serving in churches for like 23 years and hadn't been baptized with the Holy Spirit. About six weeks ago, he and I happened to be meeting. We were getting ready to set up the church. And I asked him, hey, are you baptized with the Holy Spirit? And he was like, uh, yeah, I believe I am. I said, I said, do you speak with tongues? He was like, oh, no, no, I need to be, I need to be baptized. <laughs> oh, man, this is so cool. So check this out. We asked, he received and he spoke with tongues. Can I give you one more? Sister Lakeisha, no, you wave your hand. Hey Amen. One of the newest members at Faith Family Church had come over and we were visiting and you know, we got to talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She asked, she received, but she didn't speak. When she was supposed to do the speaking part, she was like, But she took our advice, get in a place of prayer. And that's all I'm trying, I'm because I can't teach you to speak in tongues. I can't baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Get in a place of prayer and listen. Receive by faith. He didn't say asking you might, asking you will. So receive by faith. But hear this. Don't be afraid to say something that's not intelligible. 
And don't look for him to give you what to say, right? Just allow for, and the reason why I shared these testimonies, especially with Jenny, every one of them, after we stop, because you can start when you want to and you can stop when you want to. That statement alone bothers people. Because some people have been taught, well, you can't control the Holy Spirit, Pastor Stan. The Bible says that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. You know, you, t- you mess around, lose your job tomorrow. I couldn't stop and I, I couldn't get to work on time. And it's just, no, Holy Spirit, I'm not going to mess me up. <laughs> no, you can, you can stop, right? After we stopped, because we just did it for, for a couple minutes, a few minutes, every one of them, after we stopped, all of them were like, whoa. And this is separate experiences. I got the benefit of seeing them experience it. All of them was like, whoa, something is supernatural happening on the inside. Are you all getting this, y'all? So just be okay. Just if you start saying something that you don't understand, don't don't shut it down. Just, oh, man, I don't know what's going on here, but it kind of feels good. So I'm going to let it go. Let's be okay with that. All right. Now, realize, and we'll get into this more, all of us have the ability to say something that's unintelligible. Is that right? For example, if I don't want to hear you, la, 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 la. And I see people get all tight because they think I'm playing. I'm talking about la, la, la. Have you ever not wanted to hear somebody? What am I saying? La, la, la is an unintelligible expression. You humanly have the ability. How about ga, ga, goo, goo when you hold up a baby? Come on now, what am I saying? You have the ability, so don't clam up now that you go to the water to drink where you don't want to say something. I I don't want to sound like a baby. I just don't know what to say. I'm trying to hear what to say, and my tongues don't sound like your tongue, so I ain't got the tongue. Come on, y'all. Be okay to say something that you don't. All right, I'm done. I, that was all bonus material. I'll give you a little bit more of that later. Did you, are y'all blessed today? Y'all get us something good out of the word of God? Come on, come on. Woo! God's about to take you to another level. This is where you've dreamed and your dreams will become a reality. Amen. Will you bow your heads? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. And if you want to rededicate your life, I want to lead you in a word of prayer. And you know what? I'll lead you in the prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do it now, but I'll lead you. And then at that next opportunity, allow him to move in your life.